Hamas has launched what some are calling a unprovoked attack. Meanwhile, American, even Catholic politicians are responding by saying that we must back Israel. Some are saying that uh, Israel is funded by God. What is the Catholic response to Zionism? What should be the Catholic response to this new conflict in the Middle East? And we're going to get all into all the controversial aspects of that today on the Guild Family Stream. Alhamdulillah. Welcome, everyone. Ahla <laughs> as they say in standard Arabic. What would what, what, what'd you say in uh, in Moroccan Arabic? Do you say Ahlan wa Sahlan? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Same thing. Same yeah? thing okay. Yeah. Um, because there's there's standard Arabic and then there's the the regional 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 Arabic. Arabic. This is entirely different. Um, and I I learned Egyptian Arabic, but I'm very happy to be going to the Middle East with Cavazos again because Cavazos actually traveled a lot in Morocco. Was it just Morocco or other countries as well? Just Morocco, just Morocco in the Middle okay. East. Okay, fantastic, excellent. So, and I I lived for two summers in Egypt in college, and so we're both. Um, arabophiles in some way middle eastern enthusiasts and you mm-hmm. went as a missionary to mohammedans when you mm-hmm. were a, when you were a baptist right yeah i went uh basically it was like the underground mission world so they have lots of like regional protestant groups that are underground and so we would basically just kind of go underground and smuggle bibles to them and all kinds of crazy stuff like that so yeah, it was lots of fun lots of fun fantastic yeah, so we're going to be talking about the the latest conflict and taking a look at Catholic views on Zionism and the the current conflict. Um, I find that there are very few Catholic American responses to this that, in my view, really co- comprehend the whole import of this this whole this modern conflict. Uh, what's really going on? There's all sorts of uh, theological issues that arise as well. Um, that have been exacerbated since Vatican II with various confusions regarding um, the Jews and Judaism. So we're going to get into all that. So as as usual, the first portion of this is going to be public. And uh, then we'll get into all of the controversial bits in the private portion. So if you want the full treatment, go to immunityofcatholic.com slash register to join the guild and gain access to the guild family stream. So this is a preview of the full guild portion is uh, if you look up uh, Credo, the new catechism from Bishop Schneider, which is currently premiering in Rome. So this is uh, at the end of the catechism, there's an index of errors. And uh, so I've highlighted a few of them, but the one that we in in particular are going to cover in the uh, private portion of this is this error right here, Talmudic Judaism. And this is this distinction, Talmudic versus Temple Judaism or Second Temple Judaism or Rabbinic Judaism, that is the crucial distinction which needs to be made about this particular question of Zionism and uh, the Jews and Judaism and whatnot. So first, I wanted to just summarize very quickly a, a hazardly, hazard, hazardous simplification of the, mo- the history of the modern state of Israel. Um, so essentially after, uh, in, in 1900, the year 1900, the, what we call the modern state of Israel was under the dominion of the Ottoman empire and the Ottoman empire controlled this period for a number of centuries. And in Palestine, there were what's, what now are, are called Palestinians. They probably would have called themselves Arabs or Turks or something at that point, but Palestinians speaking Arabic of whom most of them are Mohammedans, but there is the, the there are Palestinian Christians. And that's the first point we need to emphasize is that something that's almost always forgotten by the American, even Catholic discourse is that the Palestinians include Christians. And these are very traditional Christians and very ancient Christians who are tied to the land, who have been there for who, who knows how long. Um, and so we have the Palestinians or the Arabs and at the time of the Ottoman domination, there were, so there were these Mohammedans and Christians who were both speaking Arabic and there were also Jews too. There were Jews who lived in Palestine already because as there's Jews scattered really all across the globe. Um, after world war one, the Ottoman empire fell 
And this region known as Palestine came under the control of the British Empire. And this is what's known as the Balfour Declaration, the, uh, the British Mandate, Palestine, where Britain was controlling this region because all of the Allied powers after World War I, they gained control over the Ottoman Empire and they, they all chopped it up. So the modern Middle East, the history of the modern Middle East is very similar to the history of modern Africa in the sense that after World Wars I and II, the Allies gained control of all these regions and then they just chopped them up into countries as they saw fit for their own interests. And this is, you know, like Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein, Egypt, all these places are set up. Um, it, Saudi Arabia is a different case, but uh, they're all set up for the interests of the Western powers. And among these Western powers were many Jews. So there are many Jews who were making, uh, they were influencing things after World War I. And Zionism really came about, came, in, came into the fore after World War I. So many Jews in the West who were, who were in places of power and influence were pushing for the Brit, British mandate to allow Jews to come and settle so they began to allow Jews to come and settle in, in the British Mandate Palestine. And this provoked clashes between the local inhabitants and the Jews. Significantly, there's actually the indigenous Jews of Palestine. Um, they had various, um, the traditional rabbi, the head rabbi, uh, um, they had various uh, declarations against more Jews coming. So there's, there's actually an internal dispute among Jews themselves as to whether or not Zionism is legitimate. And this is something that's never mentioned as well. Um, so there's these hyper-Orthodox Jews who oppose Zionism from day one, because, and they were in, in the land in the beginning. Um, but eventually after World War II, and this is what gets into the, the Holocaust narrative, the World War II narrative, and all of this sort of narrative that we're still dealing with today, people are still looking at the world as if World War II is being, still being fought, and we're still in this post-war era. And that was what allowed the modern state of Israel to come into being in the year 1948. And that was when the United Nations put into place this modern state of Israel, which originally actually allowed for a basically a two-state situation where the Arabs and the Palestinians would have their own state. The Israelis, the Jews would have their own state. That was the original arrangement. But what happened was war broke out. And since then, there's been a number of different significant wars that have significantly changed the borders and the overall trend. So there was, there was um, the Arab-Israeli war. There's the Six-Day War in 67. There's the Yom Kippur War in 1973. There's all these different wars that took place. There's all these intifadas as well. There's various, um, all these different things. Essentially, what has happened is Israel has expanded its borders. Now, uh, they did actually have all the Sinai Peninsula at, at one point, but after 1978, um, they ceded that back to Egypt. Um, but the main thing, the main contention is with the, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And the main, um, the main difficulty is that Israelis have uh, continued to settle in these regions. And this has been the, the um, assertion of the Palestinians, including our own brethren, the Christians, of course, is that the Israelis have been moving in and taking more and more and more land um, not according to the original UN agreement back in 1947 and 48. Uh, so that's been the grievance of the Palestinians that has provoked this situation that we have now. Um, it's certainly not true that, I mean, this is a situation where it's sort of a 9-11 situation where we have a terrorist organization who attacks and kills innocents. And then we have a media response, which is like George Bush, I remember him saying, they hate us because they hate our freedom, he said, uh, which is a complete misunderstanding of the whole situation, uh, which just sort of allows for a military response, which is not sober, but is emotional. And so then we have atrocities on both sides. And that, this is really the, the history of the conflict is that if there has been tr atrocities and injustices on both sides of this, Israelis doing it to Palestinians, Palestinians doing it to Israelis. And but in the midst of this, there's this idea of Zionism. So. Uh, Kavasos, tell us about, can you summarize, what is the evangelical Protestant, this is the dominant idea, which, which I think melds with Jewish ideas, American Jews and American Protestants, they both get together to promote this idea. Tell us about that. Yeah, when you look at the history of Protestantism in general, you don't see a very pro-Zionistic um, 
current of thought inside of it until really the 1830s. When you go back and you look at the founders of Protestantism, right, Luther, Calvin, you're not going to find Zionism. You're going to find just, in a certain sense, just guttural hatred towards uh, anything Jewish. Uh, that was just kind of the dominant narrative of that time. And even in the Americans, right, uh, American type period, you don't see, for instance, the Puritans, they're not Zionists. You don't see the First Great Awakening, it's not Zionistic at all. The, th the Second Great Awakening is not either. You really start to see Zionism build, though, with a man by the name of John Nelson Darby, who was in the 1830s. He was a member of what's called the Plymouth Brethren, which is no relation to the Puritan group, but the Plymouth Brethren up in Massachusetts. And he one day was uh, at a meeting, right, where there was a woman who was deathly ill, and she received this vision where it was essentially the classic left behind pre-trib rapture story. That's, you know, the Christians are all just going to be kind of doing their thing, and then all of a sudden they're kind of caught up into the heavens they're gone now this woman of course she's not catholic she was also quote unquote speaking in tongues right which goes to show the veracity of like how widespread even quote unquote speaking in tongues is in the i guess in the false sense and he takes this and he starts to really delve into theology well he starts to craft because he has a lot of jewish friends at the time this early christianized version of um, what's eventually called zionism but in christian terms it's called dispensationalism and what eventually takes place is that his protege, right, which was a man by the name of C.I. Schofield, takes more or less all of Nelson Darby's thought and puts it into a study Bible. Now, when you look around at bookstores today, Christian bookstores, study Bibles aren't new, right? We see a lot of them. There's a lot of good ones, for instance, like Scott Hahn's study Bible, right? That's a very, very good version of a study Bible. But in that time period, there was no study Bibles at all. You just had a plain text Bible. Maybe you had some cross references. Maybe some monks, right? An original copy had some notes on the side, but that would be about it. Um, so John Nelson Darby, he was friends with a lot of Jewish publishers, and he was very pro-Zionistic. And so he wrote down these notes, and in 1917, they released the first edition of what became known as the C.I. Schofield Reference Bible. Now, this reference Bible, because again, it's a reference Bible, right? That's a great marketing thing. They market it, and all of us, especially in the Deep South, the Baptist seminaries, the evangelical seminaries, and evangelicalism, it was, it was at, at the time, broader than just Baptists. It was Methodists. It was uh, certain elements of Presbyterianism as well, but mainly Southern Baptists. They all buy it, and a ton of young men in Bible colleges are now going through, and they're interpreting the Bible through the lens of Zionism. And it's particularly taken from Genesis chapter 22, which talks about how the Lord, he's giving his promises to Abraham, right? And ultimately, it's a promise referencing Christ. But what ends up happening is our Lord says, those who will bless you shall be blessed. Those who curse you shall be cursed. And C.I. Schofield reads into that. Well, what this means is they who bless the Jews will be blessed. They who curse the Jews will be cursed. The state of Israel should more or less be a thing. And so therefore, what ends up happening is, you know, he passes away. And then eventually in the 1940s, right, catching up to speed where, where you were, the U.S. government through the military industrial complex, right, really is um, very favorable toward this idea of a Jewish state for, for various reasons. And so therefore, they know, especially to galvanize the American public to be, be behind some type of issue, they can't just go out and say, here's a political issue, accept it, right? They propose it, especially even through the guise of religion. We need to support this, right? Look, it's in the Bible after all, right? You guys have been all studying this accept it. And so what ends up happening is you have lots of Baptist preachers, lots of evangelical ministers who really get on board with this. And so pretty much from the 1940s all the way up until I would say really recent time, I mean, still fairly, I'd still, I say, I would say it's the majority opinion still today. Evangelicalism is very heavily Zionistic, right? Because it is this idea that, you know, God, right, established the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, the Jews are God's chosen people still, and so therefore we need to be pro-state of Israel, pro-Jewish in this context. And so that's a, essentially the brief history, but it gets pretty bad. I mean, even down south of me, right down, right, so I live in between Austin and San Antonio. Down in San Antonio is one of the biggest meccas of evangelical Zionism. Uh, Kenneth, uh, I think it's Kenneth Hagee, Kenneth Hagee's church. Um, and he's flat out said before 
some stuff that might seem familiar to certain modern popes where he says that the Jews have a complete covenant with God still, and you need to uh, recognize that they're still saved through that covenant. Sorry, Apostle Paul, I guess, but yeah, that's where it is now. Hey, guess, guess what? We just we just had a Zionist pop in. Here we are. Uh, hey. this, is, this is Zionist himself. Can you, the can you guys can you guys hear me right now at all? I can hear you. Damn. Yeah. I've never I've never uh, entered one of these streams on my cell phone before, but my studio now has my mother in law in it. <laughs> so yeah. we're re we're rebuilding and everything, and so I had to scramble out here with my phone and so i hope that's okay I, we're uh -huh. so happy that you're with us Pele Crab. We, we just about <laughs> we're just about to get into the juicy controversial portions of this whole stream so i'm glad that you joined us right oh yes it is so coming up next <laughs> we'll talk about judaism uh post-war narrative talmudic judaism are the jews uh -huh. the chosen people do they do they have the land in fact i'm going to share a catholic perspective that i learned that i had never heard before that is not totally anti-Zionist, actually. It's by Hebrew Catholic, one of the best theologians out today, actually. Uh, very, very good theologian. It, I found it very compelling. So I'm going to share that in the stream. Uh, if you want the full stream, meaningofcatholic.com slash register. We will be back in just a moment after these messages. Mm -hmm. 